Tonight, we now know net migration hit a record of 745,000 last year. Number 10 says it's far too high. Labour that it's shockingly high. But are they going to do anything about it? We've never seen levels like this, and the records go back to 1850. The main drivers are international students and healthcare workers. But can our universities do without those fees? Would our care homes stay open? I'll be speaking to Richard Tice, leader of the Reform UK party, who's not ruling out a return to frontline politics for his old boss, Nigel Farage. And the former Labour Home Secretary, Lord David Blunkett, on why he agrees with Jacob Rees-Mogg on immigration. Also tonight, Home Secretary James Cleverley's in a hole with his colleagues over his use of unparliamentary language during a question about the town of Stockton. And as Girls Aloud announced they're reuniting, we're using it as an excuse to look back into the relatively recent past with another political quiz. All that and more with Poppy Trowbridge and Josh Simons, who'll be with us for the next hour. It's Thursday, I'm Sophie Ridge, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. Oh, good evening. Let's talk about numbers. Yesterday, Paul Johnson of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, basically the king of numbers, sat here in the studio and said the numbers in yesterday's autumn statement were sort of made up. Now, what he meant by that was the Chancellor managed to balance the books by pencilling in unspecified spending cuts, which will never happen, that's my addition, and assuming a whole set of things that also won't happen. For example, petrol duties that will rise each year with inflation when every chancellor for the last 12 years has frozen them. In politics, we're so driven by numbers. Are the books balanced? Do the sums add up? But the truth is, statistics can be spun just like everything else. And today was another day all about numbers, migration numbers, record net migration numbers. They weren't always record net migration numbers, though, because after receiving more home office and travel data, the ONS increased the number of people it thinks arrived in the UK in the 12 months until December 2022 and reduced the number who left, which means net migration during the period was a revised record 745,000. So in other words, they underestimated it before by 139,000. That is really quite a lot of people. And the huge discrepancy is apparently because they changed the mytholo mythology. It's not the first time there have been question marks over ONS immigration data as well. Four years ago, it was stripped of the National Statistic Badge of Approval for systematically underestimating EU net migration. And the problem is, you know, a lot of public policy is based on these numbers. They, they feed into the rules on how much governments can spend and borrow from school places to housing to, you know, well, the entire political debate on immigration, which could end up having a real impact on the next election. If the numbers are sort of made up, well, that affects us all. Well, on a day when we are talking an awful lot about numbers, who better to hear from first than our data and economics editor, Ed Conway? He's been digging into the data released today. This is what he found. Some really interesting migration figures have just come through. Very striking indeed. This is showing you net migration. So the number of people coming in minus those who are leaving the country. And last time around, that's what the line looked like. Very high indeed. The latest figures show it's even higher. It's even higher. It does look like it's coming down, but those numbers could well be revised. And it got up to over 700,000 uh, in 2022. But even more striking is if you look back through history. So we're going to take that same statistic, net migration, as a percentage of the population, going all the way back to the Victorian period here. And, well, you can see the story. We have never seen anything quite like this. Actually, for most of the, 18th, the 19th century, people were leaving the country uh, in net terms. But then you have this kind of period, hundreds of thousands under David Cameron, and then post-Brexit, it went through the roof. And when we just look back at those more recent numbers, OK, it, there's a bit of context that's worth just remembering here. Of course, 2016, you had Brexit, the EU referendum. Then you had COVID, so you can probably note that period there. So, you know, migration dropping down uh, a lot there, a lot of people leaving as well. But then it's those new Brexit rules and new immigration rules coming in that really kickstarts that big leap in migration, in net migration. And when you look at where people are coming from or indeed going to, well, this is EU citizens. And you can see before Brexit, it was relatively strong, hundreds of thousands, and then into negative territory after Brexit. That's EU citizens leaving the UK. Then you've got UK citizens. And then consider this, non-EU citizens coming into the UK in their droves, really, faster than we've ever seen before. 
And the interesting thing is if we break that down, so dig into those red bars and just look at what are the reasons that people are coming for, a lot of it is work. A lot of it is work. Actually, the second big chunk, biggest chunk is work. But then you've got studies. So students, and particularly after Brexit, those new rules came in, a lot of students coming into the UK. And then you've got, well, other categories. But notably, look at this. This is Ukraine and Hong Kong. So big numbers coming in from Ukraine and Hong Kong but it's not actually enough to explain the big leap. It's much smaller than this, much smaller than work as well. And also worth saying as well, you've got illegal immigration as well. It's quite a small slice. It's about kind of 50,000 compared to these big numbers here. But dig in, let's dig in finally to work, because it's worth just asking, you know, where are people working? Where are they coming to work? And you've got various different strands we can break this down to. You've got temporary workers, other work as well. But if you look at skilled work, the main thing that sticks out is this, look, it's health and care. People are coming from around the world, particularly non-EU, to work in the health system, in the NHS. That is a big part of the explanation alongside study for why you see those unprecedented numbers of migration. When I say unprecedented, you know, this is really one of the most striking things we've seen in the country recently, a massive increase in the number of people coming here. Ed Conway, they're really breaking down the headline numbers there. Well, our political correspondent, Ali Fortescue, has also been across this story today looking at the political reaction. How have people been responding, Ali? I mean, it's been fascinating. I think, you know, you have to look at the context. The reason this is difficult for the government is because they've said they want to bring that migration down. 2019 manifesto said they want to bring the overall numbers down. We're obviously a long way from the tens of thousands that Theresa May uh, and David Cameron were talking about. But Boris Johnson was talking about bringing net migration down to a quarter of a million. You can see how far we are away from that today, 745,000, the revised figure. James Cleverly, we haven't seen him today. I expect we might see him in the coming days. Um, he did tweet a statement. Um, he, of course, you know, hasn't been in the job very long. He's inherited a lot of this. But he says the figure has not shown a significant increase from last year's figures. That sentence, as soon as he tweeted that, I got about 10 messages. I got from, a message as well, actually. Yeah, exactly. so it's true. Yeah, from right-wing get, MPs yeah. who privately were not happy mm. with the way he has framed it. Um, and soon after that, we got this tweet from Swella Braverman, his predecessor, who, as we know, not afraid um, to say what she thinks. She has said we were elected on a pledge to reduce net migration, which was 229,000 in 2019. Today's record numbers are a slap in the face to the British public uh, who voted to control and reduce migration at every opportunity. Uh, and she goes on to say, we must act now to reduce migration to sustainable levels. So Swella Brahman speaking out again, we're saying new Conservatives, this group of right-wing MPs, kind of unclear, I'd say, how much power they actually yield or how many of them there actually are. But they say that these are conscious decisions by the government. So privately, they're definitely is anger and publicly I think we're starting to see some MPs raising their concerns as well. I think we can listen now to uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, one of the most prominent voices uh, familiar to lots of you. Let's listen to what you have to say. Well it's simply much too high that the Conservatives promised we'd get it down into the tens of thousands and over the two years they've revised up 2022 and then they've come up with a new figure for 2023. Between those two you've got 1.4 million net migration. Uh, that's a huge number for the country to absorb. The Home Secretary says the numbers are not showing a significant increase. Do you think that's fair? Well, I think that's an odd way of looking at it. It's only not rising when uh, you don't compare the revised figure um, with the latest figure. You, you aren't doing it quite apples and not apples. Sounds like you think he's talking rubbish. I wouldn't dream of saying that. I like, I like the Home Secretary. He's a thoroughly good egg. But 1.4 million over two years is an enormous rise and it's so far ahead of what we promised. What do you think the strength of feeling is in the party today? It's a reflection of what voters think. And my represent North East Somerset, when I go out knocking on doors, people are talking to me about migration. They don't think migration is working for them. And you think this government's got a grip of it? Uh, that's a very good question. Didn't get an answer to that one then, Ali. No, he's quite polite, Jacob Rees Mogg, but um, yeah. Like the cutting, I feel. Yes. Um, what do we think the government are going to do to respond then? Well, 
Uh, the sense I get is he's been keeping a low profile, James Cleverly, today. I think as early as next week, we could get some measures on bringing net migration down. This could be looking at um, the workforce shortage list. And we know that people who come into this country can, in some jobs, get paid less than British workers. That is something that maybe the government will be looking at. And also perhaps on the number of people, family members, that someone coming on a worker visa could bring. Obviously, there are some in government who think that a balance needs to be struck and you do need people to plug the gaps in the workforce as well. Interesting that the Labour Party, what they're talking about is similar to what the government have been talking about in a sense. And they also haven't set any targets for where they want the numbers to be. We don't think it's sensible to set specific no numerical targets because the Tories have done that repeatedly and then made even more of a mess of it. So we think the important thing is to concentrate on tackling those skills shortages, have a proper economic plan and get rid of the 20% wage discount so employers no longer have an incentive to recruit from overseas. Interesting stuff. Uh, Ali, thank you very much for talking through the political reaction today. Ali Fortescue there. Well, earlier, earlier I spoke to Richard Tice, the leader of the Reform UK Party. Now, exclusive polling for Sky News a couple of weeks ago found that the Conservatives were losing more of their 2019 voters to Mr Tice's party than to Labour. So what he says matters. So what's your reaction to today's immigration figures? Uh, they're appalling. They're a complete betrayal of what everybody who voted Conservative, who voted for Brexit, what we wanted. We were told and promised by the Conservative government that Brexit would take back control of our borders, that it would reduce immigration numbers below 200,000 a year. And instead, actually what's happened is that they've at least trebled since then. We've now got uh, people coming into the UK about the size of Birmingham every single year. It's well over 1% uh, on a net basis uh, per annum. And it's leading to huge, huge pressures all over the UK. Just yesterday, the OBR confirmed that living standards per head are falling and that large numbers of immigration are a significant part of that. We've got a housing crisis, we've got a health crisis, uh, we've got an inflation crisis, and, and we've also, Sophie, we've also got a cultural crisis. And I, this is I, let, really let's, talk, let's talk about the cultural crisis in a minute, but just to talk about the, uh, you know, the care sector, for example, 157,000 vacancies last year. There's an awful lot of people who've arrived in this country working in our hospitals, uh, for example, as well. So do we not need some immigration? We've got the highest population ever in the United Kingdom. We've got record people on out-of-work benefits. Yes, let's have smart immigration where we've got genuine shortages. But at the moment, we've got, well, we open, border, no, we've got open border chaos. And so we should be training our own people, as historically we've always done. Smart immigration, we could have one in, one out, what I call net zero immigration. That would be about 450,000 a year coming in, in the sectors we genuinely need. What you've got to do, though, in the UK, you've got to make work pay. And despite the autumn statement yesterday, at the moment, for too many people, work doesn't pay. So you're up for higher taxes are, then? Taxes are you're, at record you're highs. You're for higher taxes then to no, make work pay for, in, should, care, you should in the lift, care sector You hospitals. should lift the tax threshold from 12,500 to 20,000 to make work pay. For people on low incomes and for people on average salaries, that's a massive, massive difference. You talked about the cultural issue. What do you mean? What I mean is that for the UK to work, we want people who come here to, to want to enjoy and to live under one single British culture that unifies us all. Everything that what, we stand, what, what, our way of is, life. What is one that's, single British culture? That's about culture. being British. It's about who we are, where we've come from, our way of life. But what, does, what, does that, what does that mean? You, 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 say that, you, say that British that, you, need, you say that British culture means being British. But it what, means, what, what does it mean? It means everything that we, our values, our sense of decency, of fair play, of transparency, of, a lot honest, of people and respect who, for each other. No, a lot of people who come to know, the UK are we know decent. David no? Cameron, Tony Blair, Dame Louise Casey all said, and they're right, and Suella Braverman, multiculturalism has failed. Unifying under one, city, under one single British culture, that's where we need to go. So you need to be able to absorb immigration in numbers that can work for everybody. If you have mass immigration, you get too much pressure too quickly, as we're seeing on public services, and people don't integrate and absorb into communities, and that's what, bad for everybody. What um, would be a sensible level of immigration? So we're standing for net zero immigration, so about 450,000 people on average. So what, what would you do so then you for, for example, number. would you scrap the uh, number of people who've come here through Ukraine and Hong Kong then? Would you no, just get stop that? No, 
that's not what we're saying. You've got to look at it year on year. They, they, they are Absolutely. part of the immigration figures, a big part of it, and but, you want net zero. So was, no, what does that, that... Net zero means one in, one out. There's about 450,000 people. So for every, every Ukrainian year. who comes no. here, you would have to say but someone But the numbers has to have leave. increased since the Ukraine crisis uh, in terms of the number of people who came here. The numbers have actually increased since. Why? Because, for example, they're granting more work visas to non-EU citizens. They're granting hundreds, 600,000 student visas. Uh, and so they basically opened the borders and made it complete open season. A mass immigration is really not the right solution. It's not what people voted for. You said you want to stand in every seat. Are you thinking about doing any deals with any no. Conservative MPs who might have Zero. similar views to you on immigration? Look, I still wear the scars on my back from December 19. Are people I've texting very you clear. trying to see if, if they very can clear. have special... Zero deals with the Tories. We stand in every single seat. Democracy's better when people have got more options, more discussion, more debate, and we stand for, for many things that the other two main parties, you can hardly tell the difference between them. They're basically different forms of socialism. High tax, high regulation, pro net zero, all of that equals Richie low Sunak's growth. A socialist, it's then. a catastrophe. Yes, he, he's certainly not a conservative in the traditional sense of the word. So we've seen a anti-Islam populist leader win at the Dutch general election. Do you think it could happen here? I don't think anybody was surprised that yet another country across Europe has voted against the establishment politics. People are very concerned about very high levels, almost mass immigration, and they're saying that's not improving our living standards. And for them, it challenges their own uh, cultures within their own nations. And I think people are concerned about the high levels of, of mass immigration that we're now seeing in the UK. So yeah, I think people are saying, actually, I want to look, vote for a party uh, that stands for what are we call net zero immigration, that's the right thing to do, and that wants to make their living standards better off. And you achieve that by going for growth with low taxes, low regulation. Uh, we've got to get rid of the madness of net zero that's impoverishing us all. That's how you get high growth and improve people's living standards. Just to I have to ask you this. You've been watching Nigel Farage and I'm a Celebrity? Of course. Hasn't he been doing fantastically? I think people are enjoying seeing Nigel the, uh, you know, Nigel the, the individual getting on well with, with others, having some interesting discussions, and he's, he's revealing his true personality in many ways. And I think that, uh, that, that actually viewers are enjoying it, and I hope he goes all the way in the programme. What would you do if he you know, called you up once he gets back from uh, the other side well, of the tells world? Me I must do it next year. Says, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> what about if he says, oh, you know what, I might come back and lead the party. Would you let him? Would there be a Look, free slot? I made it very clear. The more help Nigel can give, the better. I'm As the leader. leader. He's made it very clear. He doesn't want to stand in a first-past-the-post election. We're very pro-proportional representation. That's the fairest way to conduct elections. Could he come the back as leader, help, though? But the more help Nigel can give, the better. So let's uh, let's wait and see. The Tories are terrified of the progress of reform. You're not you're not ruling out him coming to lead reform. I'm the leader. He doesn't want to. Uh, he doesn't want to stand in a first past the post election. But I want as much help as Nigel feels able to give. We're None focused, of those two things. But so we're the focused answer to the, whether or not you would we're let him come back to lead the party. Not titles and not waffle like you hear from too many politicians in Westminster. I thought you were the straight talker. Go I'm on. the straight talker. I'm telling you. I'm what, the leader, Nigel... and the more help Nigel can give, the better. There's no more straight talking than that. He didn't rule it out, did he? I, I wasn't missing it there, was I? Anyway, I've also been speaking to Lord Blunkett, who was the Home Secretary under Tony Blair in the early 2000s. Let's listen. Thank you so much for being on the programme today. It's great to speak to you. So what's your reaction to today's immigration figures? Well, for those who don't follow these things in detail, and that's, I suspect, the bulk of the population, they must be very confused because the Office for National Statistics are revising the way that they undertake the calculations. I think the term used is experimenting. And as a consequence, the figures have been revised up and we're not sure whether they're going to be revised down in the future. But obviously they're very bad news for those, and that is clearly the government who have been parading that they wanted to get immigration figures way down. Remember the tens of thousands? Not 672,000 or 745,000. So we're, we're in a different ballpark altogether. Yeah, that ten th tens of thousands does feel like another sort of lifetime almost. So in your view, is immigration too high? Well, it depends which part of it you take. I think it's really important to understand that if you strip out those who have come from the Ukraine and Hong Kong, and this was true of last year as, as well, and you take out, which I think we should, full-time education students, both undergraduates and postgrads, then you have a very different picture. 
and I was amazed to find myself agreeing today with uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who rightly says that the issue, are not in terms of secure borders or what we should do to, to deal with traffickers, but as, a, as an issue of migration, uh, the small bo boats issue is a complete distraction, in his words, distraction, and I believe that. So I think we've just got to take the different parts of what we're seeing today, get a grip where we need to. So if people are bringing immigrants in on work visas and they're paying them less than the going rate, we should deal with it. If people are bringing in dependents in an inappropriate way, we should deal with it. But we should have a rational, long-term approach. And I think from the Conservatives' point of view, they've got to ask themselves this question. Do you believe in markets? If you believe in a labour market, then you have to fill vacancies from somewhere. So does that mean you're quite relaxed then with the current level of immigration? No, I'm not relaxed because I think the system's out of control. I think 165,000 people were, were, were waiting for their uh, applications to be processed. And I think a failure to understand that you actually have to deal with uh, other countries if you're going to get this right, including much better agreements with the French. I think all of that can be done. But I think if you elevate immigration as a major political issue and then you fail to deliver, it's not surprising that people become disillusioned. What do you make about the current uh, Labour Party's position uh, when it comes to immigration? Well, I think we've quite rightly seen it as part of a much bigger picture of uh, getting people into work, of the skills agenda. I produced uh, or led on a report for Keir Starmer uh, some time ago now, which laid out a whole range of recommendations for reskilling as well as skilling people so that we can fill the vacancies of the future, uh, particularly with the onset of artificial intelligence and robotics. The world's going to change dramatically and we need to help people progress in work and to be secure in facing these enormous changes and I think if we get the, the perspective right across the board in terms of policies that are joined up we can reassure people. What I really fear is that if we're not very careful we'll end up with a situation that the Dutch are in today where they've had a far-right party do so well that uh, their leader is claiming to be the next Prime Minister and that mirrors of course the far-right Prime Minister of Italy but even she is more moderate, more humane in terms of what they call offshore processing of asylum claims than we are because she believes that it should be done by Italian uh, immigration officers, not some other country. You're talking about Rwanda there, I guess. I'm talking about Rwanda. I'm talking about the way in which the Italians, under a far-right government, would allow people back into the country if they were uh, deemed to be legitimate asylum seekers. The Rwanda policy doesn't even allow that. It's a one-way ticket, which is why the Supreme Court was so jumpy about the safety of people who go there. Do you think there is a risk as, of, as you put it, a far-right government or politicians taking control in the UK as well? No, I don't, because I think Labour will win the general election, but there's nothing to say that the Conservative Party won't absorb even further those elements that they already embraced when many members of UKIP joined the Conservative Party and we saw that with the influx of MPs in 2019 which were very much to the right uh, of the previous cohort so th there are two ways this can go either a far-right party on the fringe uh, starts to develop as the BNP uh, did s some years ago uh, or a, a right-wing Conservative Party emerges uh, with all the elements that we've seen over recent weeks with the previous Home Secretary. David Blunkett there. Coming up next, we'll get reaction to those immigration figures from our panel, Poppy Drobridge and Josh Simons, so do stay with us. A really special prize. Um, my photography shows a different perspective of the ocean. It is, in this case, a coral reef, a coral reef full of light. Uh, for me, it shows hope, the light that the ocean has, even when everything uh, seems dark. It was one of the most challenging photos in my career uh, because of the way the photo was taken. For me, it was a really special moment, and now the entire world can see that moment in a picture. So for me, it's really important to be here and show, show this, this picture, right?
the moment I just like enjoy the moment I was with a friend during a night dive because the photo was taken during a night dive at 11 p.m. Uh, with that UV light. And in this case, it was a really strong current. And I said to my friend, okay, you can hold the light for me. And I hold it uh, with my hand, another rock. And with the other hand, I took the picture. And in that moment, I was just enjoying and trying to use the same technique as you photograph the stars, but in this case, under the ocean. So in that moment, I was just enjoying. And after when I saw the results, I said, okay, maybe this one can be a really powerful photo. And it was because I get selected on the Environmental Photography of the Year. I want uh, with this photo, uh, the, um, the people can be connected to the ocean to feel closer. Every photo I took is to make that, to feel closer and closer and closer the people, to love the ocean. And after, then can take care about that, about the ocean and the species. The ocean is the most important thing we have on our planet, I think. So in each picture, I want to showcase uh, that importance that the, the ocean has. Welcome back. Now, before the break, we were talking about the migration figures that came out today. So we can get a bit of reaction now from the former Treasury Special Advisor, Poppy Trowbridge, and Joss Simons, who is Director of Labour Together. Great to have you both on the programme. I was quite struck by, you know, the Conservatives say these figures are shocking. Labour say these figures are shocking. How much difference do you think there is between the two policies, when it, two parties, I should say, when it comes to migration, Josh? Well, in a sense, not all that much, which is a sort of interesting thing in and of itself. You know, both parties seem to support some reforms to the system. For instance, Labour said that, you know, it would make it easier to change the uh, occupations that we think there's a shortage of. And it said, like the Migration Advisory Committee, we should scrap the 20% discount for those coming in. But the core point really is that the net migration figures are about the economy. They're about what businesses need in terms of the workforce, and they're about how the economy is doing. And our economy is doing pretty badly at the moment, and so we need an influx of workers. And you can't really change the net migration numbers in a serious way by tinkering with reforms to the system. Actually, you have to focus on economic policy. That's what it's really all about. Yeah, let's never have this debate again. It is the wrong question. It is an unhelpful question. And it is exactly why policymaking should be evolving. Is immigration too high or too low? Nonsense. It's, it's a question that only illuminates one half of the story. The question is, do we have enough of, work, of workforce in various sectors that we need to keep our economy going? Are we forward planning for where we know we're going to need people? Seasonal working is a great example of that. Policymaking needs to be far more dynamic. It needs to have an if this, then we achieve that, then we will do this. It doesn't need to be permanent. And too high or too low is binary and totally, totally, totally unhelpful. I think the bottom line is, do we need students studying at our universities? Yes, we do. Do we need people working in the NHS and in social care? Yes, we do. That needs to be part of the debate, not just is it too high or too low, yes or no. It's just, just so unhelpful. I mean, I agree with almost all of that. I think that, you know, the too high, too low question, we can't dodge it entirely because the important thing, and, you, you know, I guess you might not expect this from the director of Labour together, but, you know, we have to acknowledge that we are not building roads and houses, for instance, fast enough to accommodate the kind of net migration figures that we've seen today. Now, that is not a problem with the migration system. It's not a problem with the points-based system. It's, again, a problem with how quickly we are building houses and roads. And so, again, it's actually an economic policy problem. Uh, I'm interested from your perspective as someone who was, you know, inside the Treasury on how much of a difference it makes when these numbers are so out? Because they had to it really does. revise them. No, it really out. does. It really does actually make a difference. And yeah. there's there's questions there on economic forecasting. And are we are, are we asking the right questions? Is my is is the question I'm asking? Sorry, that's an incredibly unhelpful sentence. <laughs> but 
uh, they do. It does actually matter because you do need to start to plan. But I, that's my point about policy making overall. And you know, we could talk. We've talked about fiscal rules on this program. This sort of binary: we're going to get here, and it's going to be this. I think you should say we want to get here. It should be this. And when we achieve X, we will revise or do why there needs to be a sort of sec third stage to a policy making uh, aim for a target say what you will do after and then and give people a road beyond the yes or no or else it would just have the same conversation over and over sounds again. a little bit like mission-based government there i said <laughs> <laughs> so i like servant leadership would go amiss in this country right now would it um i've got to ask you a little bit about reform i was, I was struck by richard tice there in the kind of interview the full sort of interview he was very much saying that we are absolutely prepared for a mayor election we're standing in every seat yes the conservatives should be worried should the conservatives be worried about reform yeah i mean the important thing is that uh conservative 2019 voters it was a broad coalition and that coalition is peeling off in all directions either conservative 2019 voters are saying that they're not actually likely to vote some are saying that they're likely to vote for the labor party and some are saying that they're likely to vote for reform and i think the fact that richard tice is saying that he's going to stand a candidate in every seat across the country mm -hmm. and the fact that you know jacob rees mogg suella braverman james cleverly you know today again is about an argument on the right of british politics about what direction it should head in and that in the end is good for the labor party should they be worried well, i think they are probably worried and actually yesterday's autumn statement, which was really a full-blown budget, as someone who's done a number of them can say, uh, shows that. I think it was essentially a policy or a set of policies to shore up their own voters mm. who are questioning whether they're going to vote Conservative. That's interesting. So the kind of core vote that they're going for to try and make sure that they get those yeah. core Conservative votes. So vote should the Conservative Party be worried about their foreign party? Yes, but actually they've got a bigger worry first, which is their own party and their own voters, people who think, actually, this time I'll abstain. And, mm. and, and they need to convince them and then worry about who's going to switch. Got to turn out for uh, thank you both very much indeed. Really interesting uh, discussion there. Still to come on the Politics Hub. Why has everyone in Westminster been playing an eight second section of Prime Minister's Questions yesterday over and over at full volume? And what does it have to do with the new Home Secretary? Find out, find out next.
Hello, welcome back to The Politics Hub. Now, there's been an all right mighty row today, and it's all over this clip from PMQs yesterday when Labour's MP for Stockton North, Alex Cunningham, asked a question. Now, I would warn, warn you that it contains swearing, which it does, but I promise you, you won't be able to hear it. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Why are 34% of children in my constituency living in poverty? Yeah. 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 Now, now, we've got a crack team here at Sky News working on what's called OSINT, and they're usually poring over you know, satellite maps of Kirsten or like videos from Gaza, and they listened to that, and they couldn't definitively say what was said. But thankfully, we have our very own expert, John Craig, here to explain the mystery. John, what's going on? When I interviewed Alex Cunningham, he said it had been checked and checked and checked again and proved, in fact, that the person who used derogatory language was none other than the new Home Secretary, James Cleverley. So what happened after that uh, was that uh, immediately after PMQs, just as Jeremy Hunt was about to get to his feet, do his autumn statement... Uh, Mr Cunningham raised a point of order, complained uh, uh, bitterly about uh, the phrase that he claimed Mr Cleverly had used. He hit Mr Cleverly, said, no, 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 not me. Uh, he didn't say that, said a spokesman, he wouldn't. He's disappointed people accuse him of doing so. It was raised by Lucy Powell, the shadow leader of the House, at business questions with Penny Morden. But then what really created a big row was when Ben Houchen the Tory mayor of Tees Valley, Tory poster boy, ennobled by Boris Johnson, Lord Houchen, he weighed into the row and said, I'm not interested in excuses. He said uh, that uh, Mr Cleverly appeared to be dragging Stockton's name through the mud. Childish and unprofessional language used by Westminster politicians who should know better. Uh, does nothing uh, to help our plans That's uh, for progress. That's the north of England. Now... That prompted a partial climb down. Mr Cleverly then said, well, actually, I might have made a derogatory remark. I didn't attack uh, the constituency. Anyway, he said this. It's all so close to Mr Cleverly told Sky News. James made a comment. So that's after denying that he did. He called Alex Cunning something or other. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. He apologises for unparliamentary language. Um, as was made clear <laughs> yesterday, he would never... Stop giggling. Stop. He'd never, never criticise Stockton. He's campaigned in Stockton and it's clear that it is a great place. I bet he won't be campaigning there again. Anyway, Mr Houchen or Lord Houchen, I don't know whether he was being magnanimous or uh, through gritted teeth uh, grudging here. He said, oh, well, we're all human. He, that's Mr Cleverly, is a good guy and he made a mistake. But it's all very embarrassing. Um, you're right. I mean, we got all our clever people to try and uh, to try and see if we could hear it. But uh, uh, Mr. Cunningham claims that he had it checked, the, the official Commons audio. But uh, anyway, Mr. Cleverly just... has backed down, a uh, cleverly climbed down. <laughs> cleverly climbed he down. did say something uh, rather unpleasant, <laughs> but he wasn't attacking Stockton. I'm going to leave it there because I have just lost. <laughs> Sorry, you lost it, haven't you? Lost Giggles. <laughs> uh, John, thank you very much. Okay. I know it's very serious, obviously, about you know. The, the constituency and apologies if you're from Stockton for my uh, reaction there. Just um, I couldn't stop giggling from what John was saying. Uh, master storyteller. Uh, right, let's bring in Poppy and Josh. It's all, I mean, it's embarrassing, isn't it, for the Home Secretary? It's not rocket science, you know, how you deal with these situations. As a former advisor, you say, first of all, did you say it or did you say something close to it? Because it doesn't matter if you split the hair, just decide. Were you intending, were you rude or were you not rude? I mean, your mom asked you that question, you can answer mm. it. Then apologise and appeal to higher behaviour. If you fail to meet the standards of Parliament, apologise for it, reiterate why they're important, and then admit that you're home. It's just so simple, and this back and forth has only made it so much worse. Yeah, it has. It's right, isn't it? Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's, there is a funny element to it because, you know... I've campaigned in Stockton. I mean, come on, congratulations. You know, you're the, you're the Home Secretary. That doesn't mean anything, does it? Okay, you visited it. Like... It's like, you know, I have a friend who's from an ethnic minority, so I can't be racist by definition. I mean, you know, come on, the Home Secretary can do better than that, you would think. But the serious point is that sometimes people say things that really reveal their character. Mm. The veneer, the mask lifts off and suddenly underneath you see who someone really is. And for that to be what the Home Secretary says when he thinks he's not being recorded and the MP for Stockton is speaking, 
That's a pretty indicting thing. That's true. And that's actually why this could potentially be damaging, right? Because... And, and I just wish that this there has been seen as an opportunity to, to look at what they're doing together. Right? This is a parliamentary system. You write their rules in place. I should, you know, I didn't say what you think I did, but it if it was taken that way, I apologize mm -hmm. because we need to conduct debate at a certain level. Appeal to the higher power is really simple, right? Mm -hmm. Can't go wrong with that. Mm -hmm. uh, hot mic moments. More generally, it's a risky one, isn't it, for uh, politicians? Um, but they happen all the time. They do happen all Never the time. Never alone with a microphone. Our very own Kate Burley <laughs> yeah, coined that exactly, phrase. You know? Exactly. <laughs> uh, and the one I always remember, I think, is Ken Clark, who, what was it, that uh, talked about Theresa May right here on the um, Sky News studio saying she was a difficult woman. I think she, she ended up kind of embracing it, right? She did, yeah. She owned that phrase, which I had great respect for her for. But it was, again, a moment, you know, you really knew what Ken Clark thought about Theresa May after mm -hmm. that. Uh, Mask mm. slipped off. But to be fair, he, he did own it a little more at the time, you know, and this happens over and over again. And, and it, it's a conversational game. Just explore it a little more. Stop trying to deny and change and spin. Wait, were you angry? Had you had an altercation? Are you fighting over politics? Share it with people. I mean, I think that's what's so different now about politics, that, that the world can be part of the process. Mm. So explain what caused you to, to say or do or feel or think. I mean, they're not stupid. You can't just, viewers and voters aren't stupid. You can't just say it you didn't do it to make it untrue. The other thing that I think is quite interesting is the speed with which Ben Houchen came out to condemn it. Um, he is in a kind of marginal area, a mayor uh, in, in a difficult uh, place where the Conservatives don't necessarily uh, have a big history. He immediately saw how potentially damaging this was, right? That's why he came out. Yeah, and he again is, is worried about this image that I think Rishi Sunak can sometimes present and some of the people around him can present, which is that basically they're completely out of touch. You know, Stockton is a place with, you know, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people who live in it that is working really hard to rebuild its town square and, you know, and to, to just sort of think about, first of all, the irritating person who you're annoyed by on the other side of the house before the place, mm. it kind of says something about your ordinary experience, what you're engaging with every day. And, you know, notably, he's saying, well, oh, I'm not like that because I've been to campaign there. You may be, I don't know, but you may be reading too much into it because politicians have feelings and you have bad days and you have arguments with colleagues and trying to, but... What I like about watching debates is there are these rules that everyone has to adhere to, which allows for this kind of heated debate. And I think this was a missed opportunity to explain why they're so important. Thanks, both. Really interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Now, one of the main takeaways from yesterday's autumn statement was that public services are projected to face another big squeeze in the years ahead. And there are concerns that the already hard-pressed health service could face even greater pressure. Now, Donna Ockenden has conducted two independent reviews into failures in maternity care at two NHS trusts. One of the issues that she's identified is the need for funding to ensure the safety of services. I spoke to her a little earlier. Now, this isn't normally how I start my interviews, but the report that you did into maternity services recently had a really big impact on me, uh, and I'm sure it did on lots of other women who've given birth, you know, relatively recently. So I did actually just want to thank you for being so unflinching in your findings, uh, in the failings uh, into maternity services in Shrewsbury and Telford. And I know you're doing a review into maternity services in Nottingham as well now. Um, have things changed since your first report? So I think that we have seen some changes, some positive changes um, since my first report. Um, of course, the report identified the need for £350 million in funding um, and the government fully endorsed that report. Um, NHS England have now increased funding into maternity services um, by £180 million, so we can say we are halfway there. There have been some improvements um, in, in workforce and I do see a lot of good practice in units I visit around the country. But I would say there is very much more still to do. And what do you think should be done then? So I think the most urgent priority now for maternity services across England is a fully funded uh, workforce plan. Um, the Health Select Committee report, chaired by um, Jeremy Hunt when he was um, chair of um, the uh, Health Select Committee, identified this need for funding. We are two and a half years down the line since that was identified, and being only halfway there is not good enough. We've just had the autumn statements, and you know their projections are based upon a real squeeze 
in public spending, particularly once inflation is taken into account after the next election. You're calling out for more funding for a workforce in the NHS, midwives, doctors, nurses. Are you worried about those spending projections? Um, um, Yes, I am. And of course, what we also need to acknowledge is that we are spending money on maternity services, but we're spending it through claims. So we're not um, putting the money we need into care provision, in my opinion, um, but we are an NHS... NHS resolution tell us this in the reports that they publish, we're spending the money anyway um, in in claims. And so it is a false economy not to provide our maternity services, maternity and neonatal services across England with the funds that we know that it needs. When you say claims, I'm probably being really slow here, you're basically saying people suing the NHS, is that right, for negligence? Yes, absolutely. So in other words, if you had a proper service in the first place, you'd be saving money because through the legal side of things. Um, I I, I believe so, yes. Now, I mean, a number of these claims every year will be to support families perhaps in in the care of babies who are brain damaged and may well need care for the rest of their lives. And if women... Um, you know, do sustain um, significant injury or harm during maternity service uh, service provision, then yes, they should be compensated. But it is a false economy if we are continuing to spend such significant amounts of money on almost, well, compensating for the damage um, when better investment um, in the first place um, would in all likelihood significantly reduce the amount of money we are spending on claims. What, what kind of, you know, what, what we just touched on there, you know, the, the claims that are coming in, babies being left brain damaged, what kind of things were you finding when you were speaking to the families? Um, so I have met, I'm sure now, with thousands and thousands of families and I've met with all kinds of families who have had all kinds of um, poor outcomes. And I think it is important to say that not all poor outcomes can be prevented. Uh, and, and we did show that, you know, in our, in our report into the Shrewsbury and Telford Trust. But what I see when I meet families um, is that they're, almost, they're often exhausted, they're grey with exhaustion. There is, there is just something about a family who have suffered, um, you know, so significantly. Um, and... I think also it's the lifelong um, effect of uh, an incident that perhaps has been catastrophic. I've heard of um, marriages breaking down, um, families, um, you know, split apart. Siblings suffer as well if the brother or sister that they thought was coming home doesn't come home. Um, and, And so I think we need to be really clear that when harm happens in our maternity services, it isn't harm that's happens today, gone tomorrow. Families have described to me, and these are the words of a family I spoke to recently, Donna, it's us that are serving the life sentence. Donna Ockenden there, who's really been a real warrior uh, in shining a light on what's going on in maternity services and some of our hospitals. Coming up next on the Politics Hub. Girls Aloud announced their first tour since 2013. David Cameron was still Prime Minister, Brexit was still a gleam in Nigel Farage's eye. But how much will our panel remember about politics that year? We'll quiz them and play along at home as well, obviously. Up next. I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy, violent drug addict. How are you feeling? You I am angry. Legal abortion. It is an anti-woman agenda. Two women say that you paid for their abortions. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I think they will. I think they're great candidates. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Are you going to catch this killer? We are doing everything we can. 
Ghislaine Maxwell has pleaded not guilty to all six charges against her. Mum, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to Ghislaine, you just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that, but there are a lot of people who aren't. It's not the winds people fear most here, it's the water. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. Do you truly believe what you're saying? A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. Uh, ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous. I'm Martin Brunt, and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. Hello, welcome back to The Politics Hub. Now, I want to talk about Girls Aloud. Not something I thought I would say on this programme, uh, but the saying goes that a week is a long time in politics, and it has really felt like that recently. So 10 years is a positive eternity. But it is a decade since the girl group last performed, Girls Aloud, and today they announced details of a new tour to mark their reunion. catchy song, you've got to say. It's a catchy song. <laughs> but if that makes you feel old, you should just remember that when the girls last performed, it was a time pre-Brexit, pre-Trump, when the Lib Dems were still in government. So we thought we would test our panel's memory of 2013 in politics. Ready? Ready. OK, it's multiple choice, so don't worry. Phew. Right, here's the first question. David Cameron suffered a bruising House of Commons defeat when MPs narrowly rejected his call for military action in which conflict? Was it A, Syria, B, Somalia, or C, Libya? A. 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 And the answer is... It is Syria. Yeah. Full house for both of you. OK, question two. Which part of the UK hosted the final G8 summit? before Russia was expelled for invading Crimea? Was it A, Wales, B, Scotland, or C, Northern Ireland? The final G8 summit. I'm gonna say Scotland, because I felt like more common, more space, but that's I, a guess. I really should know and I don't, but I'm gonna say C. The answer was? Ooh, Correct. Poppy. Right, popping noses in front. I mean, this is all just reminding me that David Cameron's made a comeback. David Cameron and Barack Obama. Look, look, there he is. He doesn't look that much older. Right, number three. What did one man protesting <laughs> that Labour was on the side of the rich throw at then leader Ed Miliband on a visit to a market in London? Was it A, self raising flour, B, custard pie, or C, eggs? I think it's C. Yeah, you would think C, but I have some vague flower-based memory of that moment. But OK, I'm going to back you, you since you did well last. I'm going to go C too. It was C. Yeah, good choice. Poppy. I know where that, that custard yeah. pie was a different incident. I remember that one. And she wanted to probably see it on his hair if it was flower <laughs> or yeah. pie, to be honest. <laughs> Poor politicians on the campaign trail. It's, I mean. it's brutal, isn't it? <laughs> right, which party did then cabinet member Ken Clark describe as a collection of clowns with fruitcakes, loonies, waifs and strays among its members. Was it UKIP, the Conservatives, or the monster raving loony party? Well, I feel like now it would be B. I think it's an entirely plausible thing for Ken Clark to say about the Conservative Party at this moment. But my guess is A. It's definitely A. It is, let's have a look. 
It is A. You're doing very well here, guys. Yeah, it makes me feel like I haven't aged at all in 10 years. Normally, I guess, do, don't do this for long quizzes, I'll be honest. <laughs> so it's good. Right, question five. After the coalition, God, so retro, coalition, <laughs> announced measures to cut energy costs, what did the Conservative peer Baroness Rawlings propose as the answer to many of the government's aims? Did she think people should A, eat more soup, B, use electric blankets, or C, use their pets for warmth? I actually don't know because C has been mooted recently, I believe, by a, like an energy company or something. So it's vaguely familiar. So I, I'm not sure if that's a recent memory or an existing one. Well, then I feel like B wouldn't actually help reduce your energy bills that much <laughs> oh, because gosh, it's also electricity a. and energy. So should we buy okay, should we let's go for A? For a. Buy a. Okay, eat more soup. It was. I know oh. B would. Using electric blankets. She says. That make, doesn't I mean, make any sense. It doesn't sound like the greatest uh, advice, mm. I'll be honest. <laughs> right, and this is the final one, the last question. What comparison did then Lib Dem President Tim Farron use to describe how resilient and indestructible his party was or is? Was it A, a Nokia brick phone? They are pretty indestructible, to be fair. Lego bricks or cockroaches? I mean, I feel like A would make loads of sense, so it probably isn't that one. It's probably the weirdest and most unexpected one, given that it's Tim Farron, so I'm going to go C. It's got to be C. The other two are too sort of obvious. Right. They, they actually make a, a sentence that's comprehensible. Yeah. yeah. As cockroaches. I'm really not sure describing <laughs> your party as cockroaches <laughs> after a nuclear war is the, the kind of slogan you want to put on a bus. But hey, who am I to know? Oh, bless. Um, thank you both very much <laughs> for this. Um, Poppy, you were saying, weren't you, that you know, 2013 feels like a, a lifetime away because of all the, the mad journey we've been on since. You'll agree with me. I mm. am all for a middle-aged comeback, and that is what is happening here. <laughs> the, bo the boy bands do it. It's actually the, true. the more the merrier. Absolutely, we're true. all living longer. We should all be on board with the idea. Well, yeah. David Cameron is 100% uh, on board with this as <laughs> well. Well, there you go. I mean, the a middle aged comeback, comeback is the year. exactly what's happening in our politics we're, right we're now. Very pray that. Uh, thank you both very much indeed. Great to have you on the panel uh, this evening. Right, that is it from us for this week. It's been another mega week in politics. Let's see what the next one holds. I'll see you on Monday at seven. Up next, though, it is SJ with the UK tonight. So. Stay tuned for that.